Hi guys, this is Andrew with Headphones.com. Many of you guys might be familiar with the reviews that we produce at Headphones.com, and of course we conduct and produce headphone measurements to go along with them. Now if you're totally unfamiliar, headphone measurements, specifically frequency response, are extremely useful for getting a sense of how a headphone is going to sound before you buy it. But at the same time, headphone measurements are an extremely complicated and deep subject, one that's impossible to fully explain within the context of an evaluation like the kinds that I do, like some of the videos that you might have seen. I try and do my best, but it's very difficult. More importantly, it's also impossible to know how familiar the audience, you guys are. I don't just like putting the measurements out there with no context. So in this video, I'm gonna do the self-serving task of expressing what I found to be a common trajectory for people when it comes to learning about this stuff and learning how to interpret headphone measurements. Now with that said, don't take the order of this too seriously. People come at this information in all kinds of different ways, but with that out of the way, let's get right into the 10 stages of interpreting headphone measurements. All right, so stage one, deviations from flat. This stage is the most basic interpretation of a headphone's frequency response. It's probably the first thing you come across when looking at audio measurements of any kind or researching headphones online. Now this category is also where the majority of people fall. There's a prevailing wisdom that it's good if headphones have an even tonal balance without any particular region being elevated over the rest and it would be represented as a flat line. That would be seen as neutral or good or generally desirable. Now, if you're at this stage, you likely know what elevated bass looks like or recessed or boosted treble and so forth. And you're able to get a general sense of what the broad regions of a headphones frequency response affect when it comes to, you know, what you hear. So you're able to kind of correlate what you're seeing there on a graph, generally speaking, with, with what you hear. Another way to think about this would be like the general tilt or sound signature of a headphone. But if you go a little bit deeper into this topic, you'll learn that deviations from flat line on a graph when looking at headphone measurements are really just deviations from a particular target that the review site in question has deemed neutral. And this brings me to stage two. At stage two, you have a grasp of raw versus compensated measurements and what that means. Once you've learned that deviations from flat are actually compensated measurements, and the result you end up with is highly determined by the target being used as the compensation, you're bound to be more interested in raw measurements, or at least I was, uh, so that you can better understand and predict how something is gonna sound, you know, irrespective of the target that's being used. At this point, you've likely asked yourself, well, what other targets are there out there? And this leads you down the path towards, you know, the differences between diffuse field, free field, Harman, um, and I think more realistically how other targets differ from, you know, the, the, the famous Harman target. And then maybe you're asking yourself, well, why is Harman commonly used as the standard? And that leads to stage three, hating the Harman target. And I know a lot of people who are there and probably some of you guys watching are there right now. It's at this point where you will at least be somewhat familiar with the Harman target. Maybe you've watched some of my videos on the topic, but people at this stage typically don't fully grasp the extent of the research, partially because of the generally cursed piecemeal publication model that requires reading multiple articles behind the Audio Engineering Society paywall, which is super annoying, and so this is perfectly understandable. Without doing that, there's really no way to get a complete picture. I think maybe more commonly, there are situations where people realize the headphones they love deviate from the Harman target in a number of places, and this will lead them to conclude that they just don't like the Harman target. And they walk away thinking it's just a tuning for the unwashed masses, one that's been overly influenced by those who don't know any better or they don't know anything about good sound quality. Another reason you might feel this way about the Harman target is if you've ever used an EQ profile, like the many that are available, um, you know, for a headphone that you own that's intended to achieve the target. And what you find is that you don't really like the way that it sounds. And then you think, I guess I just don't like Harman. But this is also an extremely limited and even somewhat incorrect view of the research. And I'll talk more on this later. But this leads me into the next stage. Stage four, discovering other metrics beyond frequency response. After rejecting Harman, it's pretty common for people to delve into the deeper or more complicated measurements. You might be saying to yourself, time-based views like square wave and impulse response should tell me if a headphone is fast enough or if it's resonating badly. Why didn't the Harman research include these? Clearly, there's more to headphone measurements than just frequency response, right? Or maybe another example, how can a headphone with high harmonic distortion be as detailed as one with almost no distortion? That's clearly another thing we need to measure and indicate to be able to decide which headphones sound best. And further, the cumulative spectral decay or waterfall plots. What better way to look at how accurately a headphone will render the decay than to literally plot the change in level against time? And after learning about these different metrics, it might be difficult to believe that the Harman target or any 
thing that's based on you know just frequency response could matter that much uh, given how many additional metrics exist when it comes to headphone measurements or just audio measurements in general. And this leads to stage five, which is realizing that those other headphone measurements and metrics don't really matter all that much. This is where you have to do a little bit more rigorous analysis, and it helps if you've actually had the opportunity to listen to the headphones that you're testing and measuring. Um, and when you do that, you'll realize that there's something not quite right about those other metrics and what your assumptions might be or the conclusions that you may have drawn from those other metrics that you're getting. For example, the Hi-Fi Men Susvara has much higher measured harmonic distortion than the Odyssey LCD2. So why isn't it less detailed? If you actually get to listen to those headphones, you'll know what I mean. And there are even way more extreme examples than that. You might also keep seeing people say that you know headphones are minimum phase and that, that means that CSD and impulse response don't matter, so what's that all about? This is one of the things that I actually initially got wrong as well and it's taken me quite a bit of time to kind of come around on that. But if this is you, you're starting to run into cases where those other metrics that seemed like they'd explain what was missing from frequency response aren't lining up with what you hear um, or the technical explanations that you're seeing. And maybe you also had an opportunity to see those plots where an EQ that changes the frequency response of a headphone removes the CSD decay with it. Maybe you found that old HeadFi post that showed a minimum phase EQ with the same response as the headphone produces the same square wave. And you might know that a paper studying the audibility of headphone distortion found pretty negligible differences as long as it wasn't awful. And there's actually a video on this channel that also talks a little bit more about that. I'll leave that link in the description as well. So you look a little bit deeper into the other metrics and you realize that unless things are very wrong, they really aren't the thing to explain what you're hearing. And unfortunately, they don't explain what it looks like they're explaining. But now you're back to where you started and things make a lot less sense than before. And now we get into stage six, loving the Harman target. And that's probably because you'll have begun to peer around the Audio Engineering Society paywall to dive deeper into the Harman research uh, to understand it more thoroughly, to get a more complete picture of it. It's at this point that you may think that while it's a generally decent starting point, you still dislike the idea of frequency response targets that are based on listener preference. But the more you read, the more you learn how the headphone target was developed, and that while preference is a contributing factor to the end result, it's also anchored to what's been generally agreed upon as good sound in speakers. You start to learn what the actual adjustments or preference elements were in the research, and why the base shelf is where it is, for example. And this is also where you realize just how thorough and comprehensive the research is, as you see how the various different pieces all fit together. You see how each study is corroborated or validated by a different study that tests additional things, and provides a solid and interconnected foundation for what constitutes good sound in headphones. You also learn that there's so much more to the Harman research than just the targets we commonly use to evaluate headphones, like, for example, the paper on segmentation. And this is when you really start to appreciate the Harman research and you realize the reasons why many reviewers like myself use it and find it extremely valuable. On to the next stage, stage seven, understanding the differences among measurement rigs. At this point, you will likely have come across measurements from a wide variety of measurement rigs. You'll probably already know the limitations of measurement equipment like the mini DSP ears and the you know, various different knockoff grass systems that are out there in the wild. But you'll also start to become acquainted with the differences that exist among the various 7-Eleven standard compliant measurement rigs and their various features. For example, this is where you will have learned about the 8 to 10K Concha dip on the KB5000 anthropometric pinna used in the 43AGs and 45CAs, and how that's different from the features found in the BNK4128 and the HMS systems. More substantially, you'll likely have also encountered measurements done on the more advanced BNK5128, like the ones done by Jude over HeadFi and a number of other places. And I think most importantly that headphone measurements done on these are not comparable to the ones that are done on the more widely used 7-Eleven couplers. Another important thing to note with this is that targets devised on the older 7-Eleven couplers, like the 2013 or 2018 Harman target, are not compatible with this new system and shouldn't be used as a reference point on it. So Harman is really only applicable to the older 7-Eleven couplers at the moment, and they haven't said that they're going to make new research public on the new one. And that brings us to stage 8, hating the Harman target again. Many who have gotten to this stage have a love-hate relationship with the Harman target. We love it because of how useful and thorough the research is, and particularly for me as a headphone reviewer because it makes my job a lot easier. But we also hate it for several different reasons. The most significant of these is that the target is heavily smooth while the headphone's frequency response typically isn't, and generally shouldn't be because we want as much information in a measurement as possible. This means that there are bound to be meaningful deviations in a headphone's treble response above 5k that the target can't possibly be used to evaluate against. Now, now, there is a sense in which a zoomed out analysis provides a general understanding of a good or bad result, 
But for those of us who want a more fine-grained analysis, the one-half or one-third octave smoothing of the Harman target simply isn't good enough, and we're left to sort of interpret that as best we can. And if that doesn't make sense, let me show you what I mean by this. So what I'm showing you guys here for the red line is the frequency response of the Sennheiser HD800S, which is a very well-known headphone. The dotted line here is a version of the Harman target. Now the red line, the frequency response of the headphones that are being measured here, is a very fine-grained result. By contrast, the dotted line here is a much more coarse-grained or smoothed target. So let me show you what it looks like when I take the headphones frequency response and do an apples to apples comparison and apply the same smoothing as the target. Suddenly all those features that you saw earlier in the treble are gone. Let me show you once again. This is the fine grained result. You can see there's various different peaks and dips going on in the treble. And when that's smoothed to the same degree, suddenly it looks a lot closer to what the target looks like. Now let's apply that same logic to the target on its own. Because the target is highly smoothed here, we have no idea what those various different features in the treble should be for any individual. Now what's worse is that we also know that most people are not evaluating it this way either. And it gets increasingly frustrating to see certain regions of a headphone's frequency response being so heavily scrutinized, when the target doesn't tell us exactly what it should be anyways. It's just not at all obvious from looking at common headphone measurements that there are limitations to how certain regions should be evaluated. In addition to that, the segmentation paper I mentioned earlier uh, from Olive Welty and Kansarapur uh, back in 2019, it also shows one of the problems with overly focusing on the Harman target we commonly use in practice. So within the Harman research, there's a reasonable clustering of preferences around that target. Some people like more bass, some people like less, some people like tre more treble, some people like less. Um, and so, you know, there is actually a cluster analysis that's done when you go through and read the rest of it, but we never use the rest of that. So a headphone with a frequency response that deviates quite strongly from Harman probably won't sound very good, but even with the amount of work that has been done, it can't be as simple as matching closer will sound better to me. And then you see people developing EQ profiles to match the target with the expectation and indeed the kind of fervor like, you know, this is how it should sound, that it will sound better to them. All I can really say there is that confirmation bias shows up in all kinds of places. But this gets us to stage nine, probably the most advanced stage, and that's the importance of the head-related transfer function. This is a very deep and complicated subject, but in short, the head-related transfer function, or HRTF, can be thought of as the way your head and ears impact incoming sound. The way your ear changes the sound based on where it's coming from, which is also part of how we place sounds in space. Before, you knew that you know diffuse field and free field were headphone target response curves. At this stage though, if you know about HRTF, you know that they are also head-related transfer functions, and that they're individual to every head and every ear. This on its own should be a massive revelation for anyone trying to evaluate headphones by looking at graphs with any of these standard targets being used, or any of them being shown as the, the reference point. So maybe you've gone on to read a paper from a particular Danish university about the human HRTF variation, and there will be links to that in the description as well if you're curious. But this is also where a number of additional questions arise. You start to think that maybe it's possible to have a higher resolution headphone target response, you know, maybe by applying the Harman in-room target adjustment to a high-resolution diffuse field head-related transfer function, or even something more complicated. Of course, now you're upset that more graphing places don't let you upload your own target. But in any case, you've likely realized that your own HRTF differs to some degree from that of the measurement fixtures, and you're trying to figure out how you can extrapolate those eardrum responses to your own eardrum, right? Because you're ideally trying to figure out what the optimal response would be for you. You might even be looking into buying a set of in-ear microphones or getting someone to make them for you so you can measure speakers and headphones on your own head from your own actual ear response. Really, at this point, if you aren't EQing your headphones religiously, it's almost inevitable that you start, probably to a custom target that you've come up with. And the reason you might want to do this is that, you know, you ultimately want to get the best possible sound quality for you and not just rely on you know EQ profiles or something matching Harman or not, because that's not necessarily gonna be the best for you. And this leads us to stage 10, being the worst person to talk to at parties. I think the point here is that if you're ever considering or have considered asking someone else to let you measure headphones on their head with in-ear microphones, make sure they're at least somewhat interested in this topic. But there is also something else to consider, and it's that this doesn't end. As much as there are a lot of things that have been figured out, there's a lot more still to figure out. There's a lot of stuff where we we just can't predict what that's going to sound like for, for individual people. You know, I've often talked about how we're only really interpreting frequency response in one particular way right now. That being, of course, you know, generally tonal balance. And while that is super important, I really think that there's so much more contained within frequency response that we have yet to uncover and figure out what's going on there so that we can predict how something's going to sound. Because without that, you simply don't know how something's going to sound just by looking at a graph. Unfortunately, you still have to actually listen to the headphones 
to get a sense of that. But anyways, that does it for this video. Thanks for taking the time to watch it and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye for now.